Hey friends, welcome back to another video. I'm doing my April wrap up, trying to be on time this time for um, the books I read in April. If you watched my recent vlog or second to most recent vlog, you would have seen that I went away in part of April and I honestly didn't get that much good reading done. Like I was a little disappointed with what I ended up reading. I think I just yeah, it was like sort of a bit haphazard and I wasn't picking out the books that I really wanted to love, which I did speak about a couple of those. Sorry if you can hear my horse puzzle in the video as well. Well, my face tan looks a bit funny, but anyway. I thought I would start with the audiobooks and the ebooks I read and then we could hop into the physical books. Um, yeah, let's get started. The first book, or not the first book, but the book I read and listened to across a weekend was a classic golden age of detective mystery I read And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. I think I've spoken on here before that my mum is a diehard Agatha Christie lover. She's read them all probably twice over um, and has a real soft spot for this particular mystery. This is one of um, Agatha Christie's mysteries. I think that stands alone, if I'm remembering rightly. This is the one where they, someone, a murderer, invites all these people to an island and kills them off one by one. Um, it's definitely archaic, I guess, in its take on certain things. Oh my God, look at my missing middle finger nails. Does anyone else have some nails that just don't hold on to gel? So annoying. Just gonna be like this for the video. Um, yeah, it's definitely are some archaic language. I didn't find this one outwardly offensive. I know there's a couple of books of hers that are not even in print anymore for her use of offensive language. And I didn't think that was the case here. But um, yeah, not much to say. To be honest, I listened to it while I was really sick and I just wanted something to essentially pass the time. And I find that listening to detective stories and particularly a lot of the Agatha Christie that's on... Um, script is really well narrated sometimes it has like famous voice actors doing the work and I find it quite um yeah I quite enjoy listening the listening experience that it feels like watching tv it reminds me of the archers that my grandma used to listen to and I find it yeah very soothing and easy to picture the what's going on in the story unlike with other um fiction books I don't necessarily feel that um easy to make the picture of of what's going on and it is a very clever mystery you know the who done it and the the big reveal in that classic Christie manner I think it's one that a lot of people will enjoy and definitely one I would like suggest for people to start with if they've never read any Agatha Christie before I'm just seeing it was first published in 1939 which is kind of mad because it reads so like I say, it has archaic in terms of like points of view, but the language and the style of the writing feels so timeless to me and so easy to read. And as you, if you've spent any time on my channel, you'll know that I don't read old books really ever. So yeah, was happy to dip my toe into that one. And I th was thinking about listening, because I've listened to a few Poirots. And I was thinking about listening to some... Um, Miss Marple mysteries from Christy but I started one and it was so boring and then I spoke to my mum and she was like no don't do that Marple is is boring it's too cozy you should just um start with Poirot and re-listen to the ones you've already listened to sort of if you want to do it in order so anyway I didn't end up listening to any more but I did really enjoy what I when I read that one and then in terms of non-fiction I read this one on holiday and it's kind of a bit niche I think it's indie published if I'm Correct. I can't see the publisher on um, Storygraph, but I picked this up on NetGalley. This is called, which as you know, means violence on the self-injury as art as entertainment by Philippa Snow. So this is a um, investigation or exploration of the phenomenon of producing artistic or culturally relevant work that um, centers around self-injury, self-harm, violence towards oneself and the group of people. So it sort of talks about um, jackass and like that phenomenon of TV of like performing stunts and performing dangerous feats for entertainment and also sort of what goes on in the psyche of the people who do that, the copycat artists who follow on the young, boys particularly who take on the do not try this at home and end up getting themselves hurt and then it talks about um the history of the idea of Hunter S. Thompson and that era of artists and writers who were 
um, view death as this very malleable, exciting and um, yeah, something to be toyed with instead of something to be feared. And I thought that was, um, yeah, really interesting. It talks about a couple of like big YouTube channels that follow post Jackass and sort of why Jackass died and why that trend um, sort of why Johnny Knoxville became this icon that he was in, in that particular era of television and why stuff like that isn't made anymore and what it means. There is some stuff on Marina Abramovich, which was like, I get it in the context of this book, but I've probably read three or four novels in the last six months that talk about the artwork that Abramovich produced of being in the room for how many hours and leaving the gun and the knife and letting the um, the audience participate in harming her. And obviously through their inspiration in this academic sense, it makes sense, but I'm just sick to death of hearing about that particular piece of art and I think it's really boring. So I guess that didn't really work for me in that sense, but like I say, I understand why they brought it up here. And I think it's like a better place to put it than just being some random character in a literary novel who happens to stop by the exhibition or who loves Abramovich or is obsessed with it. Like, it's so done. Can we pick a new artist and a new piece of work to make your literary fiction contemporary characters to be interested in? Because this one's dead. Um, but I did think this made an interesting argument for consideration of the role of violence in um, pop culture and events in terms of toxic masculinity and hegemonic understandings of gender and there was lots of questions being raised in here and I really appreciated it quite niche I guess as a reading experience but I did like it then I listened to on audio mostly on my flight on holiday uh the Bolshoi the Bolshoi confidential the byline is secrets of the Russian ballet from the rule of the Tsars to today by Simon Morrison it's 512 pages long and it's a very long audio book and I would also say it's quite dry um this is a history a contextualized history of the Russian ballet that talks a lot about the show, social environment of art um, through the various different political changes that Russia and the Soviet Union went through in the last, I don't even know how many years, maybe it started in the 1800s, I'm going to say the book, let me see, from its distributable beginnings in 1776 at the hand of the Faustian Charlatan and the Tsarist Empire defeated Napoleon in 1812. Yes, yeah, so this is like super, super, super long history that we're covering. And to be honest, I could have chopped out the first half as I mentioned before, I'm not super interested in super old history, so I definitely could have done without that section. And it opens with the murder of someone who's connected to the Bolshoi in 2013. And we sort of backtrack from there and do the full circle history and end back at that investigation to find out who the assailant was. And I did like that framing of it from Simon Morrison. It was interesting, but there's just, as with any big historical text, like covering this much history in a book there is a lot of names a lot of places a lot of people that you have to keep track of when you're reading it and sort of moving through the different historical sections so I couldn't say I loved this one but it was an easy listening experience in terms of just like letting the information wash over you in a way that I find quite soothing um and it is really interesting to talk about the history of the ballet through turbulent times and the use of art in the in to gain political favour or to in the context of communism and a sort of a government that had its hand so deeply in so many things in terms of control of different people and I really liked that uh, talking about the career of the different ballerinas that are well known and those that defected and those that came back and sort of in and out of favour of various political um groups throughout the uh last 20th century so yeah if you are at all interested in that kind of thing I'm not sure why I'm not sure that that's a very common thing to want to read about but I just heard someone talk about it in a TikTok and I was like fair enough I'll give that a go I was in a random mood it was on script so actually maybe it wasn't on script maybe I bought it I can't remember one that was on script, which is like, this is a big caveat for weird books that Hannah likes to read about religion that maybe other people wouldn't want to read, is called The Making of Biblical Womanhood, How the Subjugation of Women Became the Gospel Truth by Beth Allison Carr. My special interest rabbit hole nonfiction is high demand religion or uh, 20th century evangelism, like Christian evangelism in the USA, which I understand is 
not something everyone wants to read about and this is definitely like a book for christian like people bible believing people this is not a book uh wholly critical of of church or of organized religion so i don't think it would appeal to many readers who weren't already religious unless you are like me and just are fascinated by religion in that context and i read um jesus and john wayne uh, was that through this year or the end of last year and i absolutely loved that book and in it it talked a lot about the idea of biblical woman womanhood and how feminism was the church so the american christian church so deeply opposed feminism because of the theoretical understanding um that through the bible that women are second to men and ba basically beth allison carr talks about her experience of her and her husband she's like very um well read and is a has a phd and has various studies all relating to theology and how she was not allowed to sort of teach in the youth group and sort of take up any position of authority within her church because of this belief in um com what's it called complementarianism that doesn't that sounds like such a long way of putting it but basically the understanding that um yeah, that women are there as supporters of men and as homemakers and as wives and as mothers and not as leaders in any religious context and how that has very deep theological roots. But she has her thesis is basically that that's a lie and it doesn't and that we need to take the Bible within its cultural context and its understanding of uh, time and place to not misconstrue the words of the original text that they believe and i thought all of that was super interesting and she weaves in a lot of personal stories about her life as a pastor's wife and her and her husband's decision to leave their church and why they left and sort of how they came to understand that everything they had been taught about gender in relation to um freedom and uh, feminism was completely wrong so she talks a lot about that experience too and understands that by the end of the book you're meant to understand that biblical womanhood is an idea constructed by men of religious power as to opposed to people of the bible so yeah really enjoyed it really like the audiobook super interesting probably not for everyone but i had a good time um <laughs> story of my life um the other audiobook i listened to and really really love this actually like this penultimate audiobook I listened to on holiday was The Newlyweds and the byline is Rearranging Marriage in Modern India. So this is a very literary um, investigation, journalism, exploration, narrative, non-fiction book. So the author is a journalist by trade. She wants to understand this idea of a love marriage, which in the contemporary Indian context is two people who marry outside of social convention, whether that's uh, people who are having an interfaith marriage, LGBTQ plus couples, people who are marrying outside of their caste or below their social caste, and then this idea of clans, which I found really interesting, which is a lot of this is considered in rural India as well, in rural communities where there is a hierarchy of family dynamics of different families who interconnect and consider themselves a clan and to marry within your clan is essentially viewed as taboo because it's considered the same as marrying within your family, i.e. incest. So it talks a lot about those different dynamics and how they differ between urban and rural communities in India. And we follow five different couples who of oh, five no maybe less than that there's one queer lesbian couple um a couple who are muslim and hindu and then a couple who are yeah within their clan so yeah three couples we follow on their journey to sort of how they fell in love the romance deciding to get married how they got the legal marriage on paper and then most of them had to flee their communities and set up new lives in mostly bigger cities in order to protect themselves because it talks a lot about honour killings and sort of the yeah the life or death situations that people find themselves in when they are running away from relationships and sort of the financial instability they find themselves in the danger and the emotional turmoil of going through that trauma of um, being disowned by your family or I guess preemptively running away in the assumption that you will be disowned and 
this is a very yeah it's an interesting narrative style that it uses so you're following in quite a linear pattern the different couples with interspersed interspersed comments about yes yeah, systems and ideas and politics that um explain the wider context of each of these couples situations and on audio i also really enjoyed that like style of it i think it worked really well so i would recommend the audiobook version of it and it was really um, evocative of the different environments and communities in Mumbai and Delhi, you could really feel the um, the claustrophobia of these people that they are experiencing, particularly the couples who were forced to stay inside and hide away and sort of felt like they were being watched. It was definitely, yeah, had a really um, a big sensory experience alongside the reading, which I really enjoyed. It, it was quite short, I would say. I didn't feel fully fleshed out in the... Um, in the conversation around these topics and it has some harrowing depictions of violence towards women and particularly like revenge violence on the families and it just felt shocking isn't the right word because i've read about this before and i also know the western media twists the um the phenomenon or the epidemic of honor killings into something that it's not but the description of these individuals lives and the pain that their families have gone through and the the alternative sort of social convention and law that the rural communities follow that's outside of the law that is um, in place in their country and the laws that I know about relationships and marriage in, in my own context of growing up in the UK and now living in Europe, it felt, yeah, shocking isn't the right word, but I guess hard to wrap your head around um, the, the violence and the sheer, the anger and the disgust that these families had at their their children and you, you you just can't imagine someone hating their child the decision their child made so deeply that they would want to harm them or harm the person that they choose to marry so it was deeply disturbing in that way I would say but I really enjoyed the reading experience and then the final book I listened to on audio was called it's a conspiracy the world's widest world is conspiracy theories what they don't want you to know and why the truth is out there by Tom Cutler this was honestly just like a filler audio book I listened to while I had jet lag one night it was like five hours long and I listened to it basically all in one go and I didn't really love it because it felt quite surface level it touched on all the major conspiracy theories you've heard before about the black helicopters and area whatever and the aliens and Princess Diana's al alive or Princess Diana was killed on purpose Elton John's actually dead all of those ones you know and love but and it just explained them and Tom Cutler was had a very sardonic tone which I did appreciate but he didn't really draw any analysis together about conspiracy theories why people there was a bit at the beginning about why people fall into them but he covers them all and explains why it's dumb to believe in them and then moves on to the next one and it didn't really feel like it had any narrative thread or anything really tying these stories together it was literally you would finish princess diana and you'd move on to the beatles like it was just like go 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 every chapter um so i'm not sure i'd like recommend it. i didn't feel like i got anything extra from it than i would from reading an article or you know anything that you've heard before so can't say i would recommend that one and then I have some physical books to show you, but I will show you first the ones I listened, one I listened to because that makes sense to me. Um, and I spoke about a couple of these in a vlog, so I'll make those reviews quite short. I listened to Inshallah United, A Story of Faith and Football by Nurudin Chowdhury. This is a book about football, as the cover suggests. It's about Manchester United growing up, coming of age in the 90s, being second generation immigrant having um, Pakistani roots and understanding the relationship between his faith being a um, devout Muslim and his relationship to Britain through the eyes of religion and his parents experience of immigrating to the UK in that period of time and it was deeply funny and moving the end particularly was really quite sad and talked was just like a a metaphor i guess for the for the pain and the anguish that um people who move to the uk and start their own businesses have to go through and the idea that there just is never a moment to rest and the physical and mental toll that has on a person and how that can devastate families through that um and yeah a lot in here about having um that relationship with your parents and understanding that struggle he grew up working class he talks a lot about um living in relative poverty in manchester and going to grammar school he talks about the era of 
Thatcher and that sort of neoliberal politics of the time that he could just work hard and get through and he'll be the best. He talks about his struggles with academics and um, his difficulty at school, which I thought was really interesting. Goodbye books. Um, and a lot in here also alongside football about pop culture and music, which I really, really loved. And I listened to this on audio, but this is my boyfriend's copy because he's a football fan and he actually pre-ordered this because he was so excited to read it. Um, and yeah, there's a lot in here about a real mishmash of just growing up and coming to terms with the things that you love and sort of being unabashedly yourself. He talks a lot about that and about um, his friendships growing and changing throughout the years and how football and music played, played a real big role in his um, coming to understand himself. So definitely recommend that one. Um, and then, did I read any other non-fiction? Yeah, a couple more. I, this is a proof copy and it's very messy on the front because I took it on holiday. This is Porn and Oral History by Polly Barton. This is Polly Barton's second non-fiction book published by Fitz Corraldo. And this, um, Polly Barton documents 19 interviews of different people's experience with porn and understanding their sexuality, our desires and the, the ethics and the morality and the taboo around that topic. And it has a lot of interesting commentary between Polly Barson. It's fully, feels pretty unedited, the um, interviews, and there is some different commentary. And if you've read Polly Barton's first book, you know that she has a lot of history with Japan and lived there for a while in her um, young adulthood. And so the people that she's asked to interview are, although varying in range and demographic, there are quite a few people. I, I think she knows everyone in that she's interviews, like knows, they're not all from the same social circle, but knows at least them one or twice removed. So there are quite a few people in here who she knows through Japan, are either still living there or have past experience there. So there is um, a thread in here about Japan's relationship with um that taboo with that taboo and with sex in general and I really liked that and I think I actually would have preferred a book that had a stronger unique quality to it like having it about Japan having it about that relationship with um sex and desire in Japan or as a white woman in Japan which she writes about in her first book and talks quite openly about those experiences not necessarily with porn but with sexual relationships and desire and dating and yeah, for me, this just felt quite unfinished, I guess. There was an introduction where she talks about why she wants to write this book and how she personally, before writing this book and going on this exploration, and even by the end, has quite a, is quite indifferent to the topic. And I didn't, and I felt that throughout the book and that made me think like, why did you, she says why she wants to write it, but that indifference to me makes it seem like I don't really know why you did want to write it because it comes across as pretty indifferent throughout, I guess. Um, and it is a complicated topic and I haven't yet read a convincing argument on it. And I think the variety of opinion you get in here definitely gives you pause for thought and there's a lot of um, conversations to be continued, but I didn't feel like um, Barton ever really put her opinion at, at front and center, which she said she didn't really want to do. But I think as an authorial voice, it then felt quite, um, I didn't feel like I was getting much sort of from that and, and the idea of publishing just the interviews to stand alone as their own opinion. I didn't feel like many of the interviews had a strong enough opinion to do that. So yeah, when I read Conversations with um, Love by Natasha Lunn, which is a completely different context, but is the narrative form is quite similar of having a series of interviews. She has chapters in between every interview where she threads sort of what she's learned from that interview and what she's bringing into the next one and combining people's opinions and did a lot more of that weaving um, and to create sort of this this final image or picture or jigsaw or whatever metaphor you want to use. And I didn't, I felt like that was missing from Barton's work. Like it felt like, yeah, this was the draft of something and it wasn't necessarily a final project that um, I could visualize as a, as a complete thing, if that makes sense. So yeah, I can't say, I can say I was a bit disappointed, which I'm sad because I love, love, love everything that I've read by Polly Barton, her um, like short form work that gets published online as well as her first um, non-fiction book with Fitz. So yeah, I was happy to read it, but yeah, I'm not, not, um, wasn't over the moon in the end, which was a shame, I guess. A Fitz Corraldo book that did bring me a lot of joy and definitely didn't disappoint me was Dandelions by Fia. Uh, 
Leonard Doozy. Doozy. Um, this is a super interesting piece of non-fiction out by Fitz and is such a Fitz Corrado book when I think about it. Um, and the, yeah, the narrative form and the interest that this, um, this book plays with. So we follow um, a series of phone calls between Thea and her Italian grandmother. So Thea's family have roots between Sheffield and Manchester and London and then um, rural Italy. And she's on the phone to her grandmother weekly trying to collate somewhat of a family history to understand sort of migration particularly between the UK, um, England and Italy and sort of how her family moved back and forth, the various tragedies that struck her family particularly in relation to passing of young children and um, difficulties with health and so we have the present day sort of on the same page as the history when we hear the phone conversations and um, Thea illustrates sort of the reluctance of Dursi, her grandmother, to say certain things and not bring up other things and has that real humane quality to the writing as well as a lot of archival information and understanding of, yeah, sense of place, of migration and particularly a lot of threads in here about her family's relationship to the various political changes and the, and the difficulty that went on through Italy and why her family migrated to start with and um, conversations a lot about Mussolini and about fascism and about resistance which I really enjoyed understanding and that idea of rose tinted glasses and her grandmother misremembering or perhaps rewriting the family history in order to make sure they were always on the right side of it and I loved the tone of which that took there was a bits in lots of bits in here about food and um, some deeply yeah sad and moving and tragic stories like I said about um, the struggle of um, Italian migrants at the time in Sheffield and sort of why they ended up there conversations about industry and um, her grandmother worked as a seamstress and took on extra work for the family and how difficult she found it to make relationships with other people in the area and this idea of being split between two places so we hear both fears contemporary understanding of, of her identity as um, British Italian and then her family and her yeah her grandmother and um, other relatives understanding of their relationship and how that generational shift occurs through um, different migration patterns and her grandmother's near a hundred I think as we are reading these stories and she talks yeah can in contemporary times about the pandemic about how Thea wishes to visit about the changing narrative of the book because of the pandemic and I really liked that peep behind the curtain which I feel like appears quite a lot in Fitzcarraldo books where you get to see the inner workings of the authorial voice and that to me adds real strength and like I say humanity to the story so I really really adored Dandelions and it wasn't what I thought it was going to be but at the same time it was beautiful there's also some real um tender moments of food and um yeah, familial relationships around dining room tables, which is like such catnip for me. I love that imagery and that conversation and Italian cooking obviously is so legendary in so many people's lives. And I think this one, um, yeah, really holds testament to the power of food as well in there. And I hope that um, Thea Lennon-Ducci writes some more on food writing, like straight and proper, because I think that would be brilliant as well. So definitely recommend dandelions if you're doing a Fitzcarraldo order anytime soon. I think that's all I have for non-fiction so let us go through the final novels that I read. I read my second Vigdis Hof, that is definitely not how you pronounce it, any Swedish Norwegian friends can tell me Norway um, how to do that because that's not very that's not right on my part I don't think but this is Will and Testament like I say my second of her novels because I read Is Mother Dead earlier in the year absolutely loved that I wouldn't say I love that this as much um but it does have a similar style and it has such a unique authorial voice like I think it's one of very few authors that I've read in recent years where I could take everything off of the book and read a piece of her work and know who it was like I feel like she has a real dry and sardonic sense of humor her characters are very archetypal and you can archetypal and you can relate them to characters that appear in her previous work that I've read so this is the story of a family as the title suggests will in testament it says four siblings two summer houses and one terrible secret so it has a similar setup actually to is mother dead and I'm interested to read I think I only have long live 
long horn um, of hers left um, that's been translated. I think she has more work that has yet to be translated, if I'm remembering correctly. But um, I can see the comparisons and sort of the similarities between the, um, the character structures that she uses. So there is like a black sheep of a family who's normally the character that we are most invested in, that we are following who's had some kind of wrong or has performed a wrong and is trying to make their way back. So we follow, wow, I love the, um, what do you call it, in pages of this. Um, like it says, there's a will that we're finding out as her parents are not yet passed away, but are entering their later years. And there's a will that's being divided and part of it includes two summer houses on the northern archipelago of Norway. And um, they are being given to two siblings who are sort of still in with their parents who spend a lot of time with them whose children are sort of grandparented by um the elders and are considered yeah part of the close family and then we have our character who is not receiving the summer houses because they feel um they have distanced themselves from their family because of trauma they they received from their parents as a child in a horrible series of abuse essentially and then we have the um, but the the other estranged far, um, person who was also abused, not in a as graphic of a way as our understanding as it goes, but is um, has definitely sided with our character to understand that the family dynamic is wrong. And it follows basically a series of events leading up to the decision of the will and the um, battle to accept that some the family dynamic has changed and understanding those interpersonal relationships after trauma and this is essentially a book about um yeah living as an adult with childhood trauma and it's so well done like I say the interpersonal relationships that she writes are so well written to me so realistic so walking off the page to understand this is a story your friend's telling you about their life instead of a fictional character talking about theirs and I think she writes them so well and like I say the tone for me works really well I can understand for other people they might find the writing or the translation at least a bit quite dry and I'd be interested if anyone has ever read this in the original Norwegian writing I know it caused huge controversy when it was published in Norway and Tom and I were reading um, a lot about that because we have um, both read both of her works and I think we will put it into a podcast episode over on our patreon but um yeah i'd be very interested if anyone's read it in the original context because i really really enjoyed it and i think the writing style like i say is lyrical and but slightly dry and with short chapters and slightly offbeat i guess in a way that i really really enjoy speaking of offbeat and <laughs> unique i read um of off by Miriam taves and this is a book um that i adore this is the best book i read on holiday by far and i think tom would say the same thing and in a similar way to um, Victor's Horth, I think uh, Miriam Taves has such a unique tone of voice. And like a, this for the same thing goes, I could take everything off of her books and know a piece of writing was hers. She has that offbeat humour, that brilliant characterisation, those interpersonal relationships in a really similar way, actually, I think. Um, although tonally quite different, I think. Um, of off this book in particular was very funny, although deeply, deeply sad at the same time. But... Um, Miriam Hayes writes with such levity to her words that you really can can experience the spectrum of emotions just through one chapter. So this follows the story of Alma Voth, who's a, com a child or a teenager coming of age on her Mennonite colony in Mexico, where her family fled after growing up in Canada because of a tragedy. And a film crew arrived through an agreement with her father to produce a film like a big blockbuster film by quite a renowned filmmaker on their property because they want to have real Mennonites quote unquote in the film and Irma Voth finds her way into the film crew and we follow her sort of on this adventure as being opened up to the outside world as someone who was obviously sheltered for a long time whose dad is deeply religious whose family dynamic is deeply dysfunctional and um yeah, she starts, strikes up a relationship with various members of the film crew and talks to them about her life and then ends up in Mexico City at the site of one of the most historic protests of all time there with her little sister Aggie who wants in on the action and wants to be taken away by her because um, she doesn't want to be part of the family dynamic anymore and it's really interesting on that inside-outside culture of high-demand religious groups and isolated 
religious upbringings like the Mennonites and as it previously expressed in this video I love to read about religion so that's why Tave's books works for me she has a family history of Mennonite culture as well so she writes from a place of um, real knowledge and intellect which I really appreciate and I just love her work so much and Tom and I are on a mission to read everything else of hers we haven't read this year and then we're going to make a big video on Patreon sort of about our experience of loving her so much because there isn't a book that she can do wrong for me so this is a, a message to implore you to read um, Miriam Tays if you haven't yet and then a couple of final novels like why I always sit down and want to make these videos short and snappy and then I end up talking for ages and they're with no eloquence at all so apologies for that this is Home by Kaylin Steed this is the first novel I read on holiday and I think it got me off on the wrong foot if I'm honest this is a debut novel so I don't want to sit here and slander it but it didn't really work for me so you follow Caitlin um you've not Caitlin you follow um Zoe in alternating chapters between her life out and her life in of a cult so she's part of a she was part and born into a group that is um yeah deeply religious and believes in a very strict version of Christianity where everything sort of outside is satanic and dangerous and dirty and they live a very isolated community life in a house that's segregated, segregated by gender and they work to um, be self-sustaining and understand that they are sort of the only pure people left and, and everyone outside is um, yes yeah, sullied as they call them by um, yeah by the secular world so we know from the get-go that she is out, she's working in a cafe and we have those sort of trope-like conversations of not knowing certain films or not knowing how a coffee machine works and those kinds of things, which I didn't particularly, didn't particularly bother me, but they were quite heavy-handed, I would say. And then the chapters of her inside growing up and understanding sort of where she came from. And then the propulsion that moves us through the plot of this book is her wanting to go or being found by the cult leader and wanting being asked to come back and sort of wanting to go back to save her blood sister, who is a sister who is like by relation related to her. But in the cult, they were considered blood relations were considered irrelevant and almost dangerous to, to know who you were actually related to, because obviously family ties and any sort of allegiance to anyone except the leaders is cause for concern on their behalf. So there is that, um, like I say, propulsive factor moving you through the story. And I think that in itself was quite convoluted and not complicated to understand, but just, yeah, just convoluted and um, ever changing in its, in its um, what you were meant to be focusing on. It felt, yeah, unfocused in that sense. And then that, I think, because that was complicated and convoluted, sacrificed any character building or understanding of... Um, you understood why and it's obviously quite obvious that she wants to get her sister out and she knows what she was in was bad but the the law so to speak of the um of the cult was like so deeply explained and complicated like unnecessarily complicated that you spent a lot of time in the um flashback sections and the past sections trying to understand sort of the different rules and conventions of the group and it was sort of Handmaid's Tale meets Jehovah's Witness and it felt like um, Steed had spent a lot of time creating the environment in in their head and sort of understanding how everything was going to work and then it wasn't really inserted into the book in a very seamless way like it felt quite yeah just um, heavy-handed and not not a smooth reading experience and I think reading this also reminded me that I'm not super I have to have great writing and great character before I have great plot and I thought when I read this oh maybe I'm just not in a plotty mood but I read Emma Voth straight after it and loved it so then I realized actually it's not that I don't like plotty books it's that I have to have plot has to be accompanied by those key elements that I really enjoy. I know that that's up to me as a reader. Like some people only want to replot or they only really care about the interior um, character study type books. And I think for me, I, I do enjoy a good book, good, good plot, good writing type of book, but it has to have that good writing in it. And I didn't feel like this book did. I have found a lot of clunky sentences and unrealistic dialogue and it didn't, yeah, it just didn't set my world on fire in the way I wanted it to because as previously expressed I love religion and cults so like this should have been a book I loved then finally the book I read on the last weekend of April 
was Brutes by Diz Tate. And this was a narrative, not definitely not plot driven, very confusing, um, whimsical fever dream of a novel about a group of girls in Fool's Landing, Florida, that um, we meet as one of the older girls, Sammy, who is the preacher's daughter, who's part of a sort of higher social class of the of the community is going miss goes missing and we're on the search for her finding out what the girls know what the mothers know who are like the choral group of women who um look after the various girls and sort of in and out on each other's houses have that really tight-knit community feel but at the same time very gossipy and snarky and um disappointed with their financial and social situations that they find themselves in this is definitely feels like a very floridian book from my understanding of florida and conversations with friends who have lived there or have visited it had that very swamp like feeling to it it was very heady and um and yeah and very confusing at times it doesn't really have a narrative shape that i could suggest like it felt very fluid in that way and if you watched my recent vlog i talked sort of in detail about the plot and the understanding of it because it is very metaphorical, very, very heavy on the metaphor if that's not for you and you kind of close the book and think, is that what happened or is this what happened? Um, but I really liked that and I liked being taken on a ride with Diz Tate. I didn't necessarily feel secure on the ride the whole time and it definitely left me questioning things. Um, but I quite like that doubt as a reader. I like not to be spoon fed everything and I think this did a good job at of exploring complicated and traumatic topics like sexual abuse and sort of um, rings of men preying on vulnerable girls and understanding that fame is, is often suggested as the way out of people's social economic situations, but in fact traps them further in to sometimes poverty or sometimes just deep dark distress and trauma. So I loved the way Diz Tate handled um, trauma in this and it was very much off page and very much left up to the reader, which I think for covering a topic that could be considered very graphic and trauma plotty that this didn't do that. So yeah, I really, really did enjoy this one. Like not a perfect book by any means, but intriguing and a fun reading experience. And definitely I will pick up more of Diz Tate's work in the future. So that is everything I read in, I was going to say May, but I meant April. <laughs> um, let me know if you read any of these, if you have any thoughts. And I would love to hear from you if any of them you're planning on picking up. And I will see you all in the next one. Bye.